Ryan Kamara, thank you for joining us. Congratulations with your really interesting film, Royalty Free, the music of Kevin MacLeod. Can you just start by telling us how you came across this subject and why you felt compelled to make a documentary about Kevin MacLeod? Well, I had been using Kevin's music for years, since high school, basically. And I had just been using them project after project after project. And I was editing uh, together a trailer for something else I'd done. And I, would, I was planning on, what was my next project going to be? And hey, uh, who's this Kevin guy whose music I keep using over and over again? And then I looked him up on IMDb. It had 1,000 credits at the time. My eyes just kind of went Pew! And then on YouTube, it was in the millions. And that's just like, when you do a search, it only really gets into the keywords or like what's in the about section. And so his music goes even further than that. And I was just like, oh my God, who is this guy? I need to tell his story because did anyone else do a documentary on him? No. Oh my God, I got to do this. And yeah, I felt like I needed to tell his story, especially because aside from a few scattered interviews here and there, he hadn't really done anything. And so I went ahead and I emailed him and I was like, hey, can I uh, do this documentary on you? Let, let's meet up. I'll, you know, I'll bring you through my thought process and all that. And he was like, yeah, 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 okay, okay. And then I went up to him, like I had prepared, like, big binder this thick of like, this is the documentary, this is what we want to do, this is who I am, giant book page pitch. And you just kind of look through it. Yeah, okay, <laughs> you do a documentary. I was like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just ask you, when you say you were using his music freely, I'm very keen to know about the culture of free content that I th you do address in the film and your attitude initially when you were making these short films, these videos and using that free music, how do you regard the culture of free content? It's something that a previous generation immediately would have said, okay, I need to use music who do I need to contact? How much is it going to cost? Uh, what are the copyright issues? This is something that current generations don't think that much about. Well, I think it's several things. Um, the first one is when you're thinking of, oh, um, back in the day, I need to figure out who did this music, who did that music the bar for entry to make content to begin with was massive. And so like, if you're gonna spend $30,000 to make a film or even more, you gotta know your stuff. You know, you have to make sure you have all the music rights, you have to do this, 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 you have to be on point. But now the entry is just a phone, or anything really just get just internet connection essentially and because of that you know you have a lot of kids or you know generally people who are like oh i'm just making a little youtube video a little thing for facebook i, I don't i don't need to worry about anything um oh I'll just post it on tiktok uh, put some uh cardi b well yeah okay whatever um, so they, they're not really in the mindset of, oh, I got to be all business-like. Um, so I think that's a giant shift and why there has been a little bit of this thinking. Um, now, for all the generations also, um, I touched on this briefly, but there used to be giant royalty-free like CD collections that were, you know, 100 or more, and you would just get a giant CD with pretty crappy music that you can use in whatever thing you needed. And so there was a little bit of this, but now uh, because of 
so much more competition and because of Creative Commons, people are able to share that music for free. And even with that, there's a barrier of even knowing that there is free music out there. And there is way more free music out there than there was before because of the internet as well. Uh, there's also the matter of uh, essentially money. When money comes into it, people start to think more, kind of going back to it before. So there was YouTube partnerships, um, which started in 2008, 2009, uh, shortly after Google bought YouTube. And before that, everyone just kind of, it was more Wild West and just, oh, I'll use Beyonce, I'll use this, I'll use that. But when there was a possibility of making money um, and also the, well, there was the carrot of making money and the stick of the more stringent copyright institution like the Content ID system mm. hounding you down, people were, oh, okay, now i got to get free music. I have to become more professional. Or, oh, I'm going to keep getting copyright strikes. I need to find something I can use. Oh, what is free music? Boop, 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 boop. And so it's a multitude of factors that are leading into the current system as we have it. Right. Sorry for the super long answer. But, <laughs> not, mate, not at all. Uh, no, that, no, that, you need to be a lawyer to... <laughs> To even like start to really get into the weeds on this. Yeah, no, that's so. that, 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 no, that's terrific. Uh, one of the most interesting aspects of your documentary is the deceptive appearance of Kevin McLeod, who seems quite a pleasant, you know, nerdish, kind of modest kind of guy. Then you get onto the issue of the real life cost that free content can have on musicians and composers. I wanted to know, did you plan on developing the documentary into that realm, or is this something that came up while you were talking to him? A little bit of A and B. So I had always intended to show both sides of the Kevin McLeod story. Uh, I tried to do a journalistic approach to this, um, though it's when doing the story, the research, essentially, that the the true scope of the whole movement around what's going on gr dawned on me with the digital audio revolution and the democratization of music being massive bubbles to the story that just extended beyond Kevin. Although it also encompasses him. So it's a giant Venn diagram. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I had always intended to do it. I just didn't know the full breadth of the issue. Were you a little bit surprised, in all honesty, about his reaction when you raised the issue of the real-life cost of making his uh, material at least partially free? Um, well, the, the rationale, no. I mean, I know, after talking with him for a while, it kind of just sort of made sense. Like, um, oh, I have music. Nobody wants music. Let me put music online for free. People like downloading this music. Oh, here's this... Uh, common creative commons thing oh let me apply that oh people need to not want to credit me or they want to ask for custom compositions oh okay and so it's just kind of step by step i could follow the thought process sure uh now can you just tell me a little bit about the nuts and bolts of the making of this film I'm always very interested with independent American filmmakers about how they raise the finance because in Australia we're at least lucky enough to have some access to government money and there are a number of other funding bodies, government funding bodies, that people can go to. Uh, it's not a free-for-all and it's not uh, necessarily very easy, but they do have that option. 
you don't have that option, do you? No. Um, oddly, it seems like in America, the only way for you to get grants and things like that is to already have the money to begin with. <laughs> You need to be at a point where you don't need money in order for people to throw money at you. Uh, so that, the, yeah. Um, any grant attempts by me uh, were did not go so well. <laughs> um, but uh, I did manage to do a Kickstarter for this project that raised about thirty thousand um, dollars. So that was where I got a huge chunk of the money, and then the rest of it essentially came from me and my partners and parents and such. Uh, are you able um, to tell me, if it's not a rude question, are you able to tell me how much the documentary cost in all? Because it looks like a, a pretty standard professional doco. You can't see that it's a low-budget film necessarily. So I'm very keen to know, given how good the film actually looks, how much it eventually cost. Well, thank you for the compliment. <laughs> I, I was trying to shoot for the moon, even though the budget was really low for this kind of thing. Um, I haven't done full accounting, or at least I have, but like it, it's not really in my mind. But I wanna say uh, 45, 50,000 maybe. Congratulations, quite a, that's uh, remarkable. Quite, quite a huge chunk came from my pocket. Right. And, and um, I mean, it, it could be weights, it could be smaller, but it was definitely a lot of money from the Kickstarter and from me as well. All right. And can I ask, what do you do for a living? Um, nothing, <laughs> because COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, 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 normally, though, normally. Um. Well, uh, I worked for a movie theater, and I was uh, doing this documentary, All right. essentially. Okay, and, and what has been the life of the film? Has it mainly been playing in festivals? Um, and just tell me about the online presence. Uh, yeah, it's been um, in a few festivals now. Um, there's... Two or three coming up in January, um, with another one or two coming up after that. What has been Kevin McLeod's reaction to the film? Um, that's been hard to say. Um, I don't really know. He's a bit guarded. Um, like I've shown him the film. I definitely know he's seen the film, <laughs> but I, I don't really. No, um, so yeah, that's fine. But what and what about the reaction of audiences? What kind of feedback have you had so far? Oh, uh, the audiences so far have loved it. Um, so I, I've been blessed in terms of that. Uh, yeah, across the board, it's been pretty uh, pretty well regarded, and I'm super gl you know grateful for that because the film took seven years to get up to this point right uh it started in january of 2013 mm. like the concept when i was editing the trailer i was going to ask uh, you this um, and this is a a common question that i like to ask filmmakers you say that it took seven years from inception to now that is a remarkably long development period what keeps you going during a process like that? Seven years is a very long time. Um, oh, just, I started this thing, I'm going to finish it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it was mostly just 
a matter of, like a lot of it was just, just kind of waiting so like it was research 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 and then it was like okay uh hey x when are you free to do an interview <laughs> three weeks from now okay oh there is uh this convention out in los angeles when is it oh it's a year from now okay uh so you know doing this documentary it's way more spread out than a narrative film would be like a typical narrative film you know once you start shooting it's like a two to four week block more, more or less and it's just boom 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 with this um the film wasn't based on a specific event like oh kevin's doing this great concert and we're gonna follow him up all the way to the concert no 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 um i wish i got lucky but no, so it was much more spread out, and then I had to actually get a hold of these people and those people and those people, and you know, um, piecing the story together. The editing took quite a while as well. What did you shoot the film with? What kind of camera? Well, um, I'm actually about to film it behind the scenes. <laughs> this is my camera thing right now. <laughs> um for the dvd and stuff but uh because i i always ask that with my when i ask other people uh we filmed with a nikon d810 as the main camera so that would typically be like the wide to mid shot camera right and then for the and for the close-ups we used a panasonic gh2 audio was a ntg3 and a road pin mic 